Though most of Arrakis as we see it in Dune is the planet before the Fremen's ecological dream takes shape, we are able to witness its transformation as events transpire throughout the series. This transformation begins under Paul Atreides as the Emperor in Dune Messiah, but it is not until the events of Children of Dune, when Leto II realises the ramifications of what has begun. As the desert world changes, the sand trout are slowly disappearing. Leto realises that the sandworms are doomed unless the course of the ecological transformation is modified. Most of the observations of the transformation of Arrakis are seen through the youthful eyes of the twins Ganema and Leto II. It is actually through their other memory that they are able to compare the state of the environment from previous times. The changes to the ecosystem of Arrakis are happening on a slow gradual scale, and unnoticeable to most individuals. The Fremen would seemingly be happy with the return of water to the surface on the planet, and the transplantations of greenery and animals to certain regions. To the Fremen this environmental change is the fulfilment of their long held dreams, entwined with their religious beliefs and view of Paul Atreides as Messiah. The twins recognise that if they are to convince people of the threat to the planet, they must do so in terms that the Fremen would understand. The new outlook involved a real change of consciousness which flooded them with observations. As Liet Kynes had said, the universe was a place of constant conversation between animal populations, the haploid sand trout had spoken to them as human animals. The tribes would understand a threat to water. Leto said. But it's a threat to more than water, it's a... She fell silent, understanding the deeper meaning of his words. Water was the ultimate power symbol on Arrakis. At their roots, Fremen remained special application animals, desert survivors, governance experts under conditions of stress. And as water became plentiful, a strange symbol transfer came over them even while they understood the old necessities. You mean a threat to par, she corrected him. Of course. The Fremen, they realise, are becoming water fat, and it is only through the understanding that their wealth, the spice melange, may be threatened, that the twins feel they may be able to convince the tribes to act. In addition to the sand trout dying out, the climate is also going through changes. Becoming warmer in the northern latitudes, and atmospheric carbon dioxide is also increasing. Dew has also become plentiful on Arrakis, and more and more hectares of green land are being planted and landscaped each year. These indicators are essential to understanding Frank Herbert's viewpoint of ecology as being a long term process, which human beings in their short lives are often profoundly ignorant of. As the changes occurring to Arrakis are happening on such a swift ecological timescale, even those transformations which are happening within a generational framework are going unnoticed. The following quotation shows Herbert's attitudes perfectly, that humans need to be made alert to what is happening to their environment. Limits of survival are set by climate, those long drifts of change which a generation may fail to notice. And it is the extremes of climate which set the pattern. Lonely, finite humans may observe climactic provinces, fluctuations of annual weather and, occasionally, may observe such things as, this is a colder year than I've ever known. Such things are sensible. But humans are seldom alerted to the shifting average through a great span of years. And it is precisely in this alerting that humans learn how to survive on any planet. They must learn climate. Arrakis, the transformation after Hark Alada. Some of the Fremen do, however, notice the changes to the planet are having unforeseen consequences, as does Alia, the regent. In controlling the Atreides throne, she realises that the changes to Arrakis may threaten that which her hydraulic empire relies upon for control, namely, Melange. Alia does not want this knowledge to come to the fore relying on the religious appeal of the promise of the Atreides to change the face of Arrakis fulfilling Fremen prophecy. When the information of the damage being done to the sand trout populations is presented in front of her, 
Alia dismisses them as superstitions. The Atreides have used religions and mystical beliefs to further their needs amongst the Fremen to gain the Empire, and now she uses them to dismiss the ecological concerns of the tribes. Yes, my lady, we of the desert see terrible things happening. The little makers come out of the sand as was foretold in the oldest prophecies. Shai Halud no longer can be found except in the deeps of the empty quarter. We have abandoned our friend, the desert. Gavin, what is this talk of little makers and the scarcity of sandworms? Mother of Moisture, he said, using her old Fremen title, we were warned of this in the Kitab al-Ibar. We beseech thee. Let it not be forgotten that on the day Muad'Dib died, Arrakis turned by itself. We cannot abandon the desert. Ha! Alia sneered. The superstitious riffraff of the inner desert fear the ecological transformation. They, I hear you, Gavin, Jessica said. If the worms go, the spice goes. If the spice goes, what coin do we have to buy our way? Sounds of surprise, gasps and startled whispers could be heard spreading across the great hall. The chamber echoed to the sound. Alia shrugged. Superstitious nonsense. Jessica realises that Alia's responses are being dictated by her other memory, not knowing who it may be, but that it is simply someone who wishes to destroy the Atreides. Jessica understands that the ecological transformation has become a tempest out of control, and that the planet Arrakis is turning against those who live on it. Alia's response to this indicates her desire, even delight, for the ecological changes occurring to continue at pace. Rather than the Atreides throne suffering from the loss of Melange on Arrakis, she understands that the scarcity of this commodity will only increase their power in the Imperium. The Atreides, with her as regent, will control what little remains of the spice melange, making it a rarer commodity than ever before. Their hydraulic despotism will be unbreakable, and in a universe where withdrawal from spice use is fatal, all will seek the Imperium's favour for this precious commodity. Control of scarce melange will allow the Atreides to permanently seal their authority on the Empire of a Thousand Worlds, and have total control over powerful factions such as the Guild and the Bene Gesserit, both of whom depend heavily on the spice. Spice production will fall to nothing, or at best a fraction of its former level, and when word of that gets out, We'll have a quarter on the most priceless product in the universe, Alia shouted. We'll have a corner on hell, Jessica raged. With Jessica and the twins under threat from the deranged Alia, it falls to Leto II to accept the requirements of the Golden Path and begin his transformation into the half-man, half-worm, God-Emperor. As Leto II transforms himself, he begins the undertaking of slowing the process of ecological change by making guerrilla attacks against areas in full swing of environmental alteration. He destroys a number of such places with the power the worms have given him, his plan to ensure that, within a month, the ecological transformation will have been set back a full generation. That'll give us space to develop the new timetable. When we return to Arrakis in God Emperor of Dune, some three and a half thousand years have passed, and the transformation of Arrakis is complete, though now following the plans of Leto II's Golden Path. Arrakis now only has one desert, Leto II's personal Sarir, and the sandworms are extinct. The Fremen as a people are all but gone, those remaining being called Museum Fremen, mere shadows of their ancestors with no survival skills. Melange is scarce, the only real source of it being Leto II's personal hoard. His rule as the leader of a hydraulic empire is absolute, and with his virtual invulnerability and almost total prescience, he is worshipped as a living god. It is with Leto II's sacrifice at the end of his rule that will recreate the conditions of Arrakis back into a hostile world again where the sandworms can return 
although they will not be quite the same. Each will carry a pearl of his awareness, granting him a form of immortality as a divided god. Leto II explains to Maneo how this transformation will bring about a new Arrakis, harsher than before, creating an environment that will bring new rigour to mankind. This is the goal of the Golden Path. Some day I will go back into the sand. I will be the source of spice then. You, Lord? And I will produce something just as wonderful, more sand trout, a hybrid, and a prolific breeder. Trembling at this revelation, Moneo stared at the shadowy figure of the god Emperor who spoke of such marvels. The sand trout, Lord Leto said, will link themselves into large living bubbles to enclose this planet's water deep underground, just as it was in the dune times. All of the water, Lord? Most of it. Within three hundred years the sandworm once more will reign here. It will be a new kind of sandworm, I promise you. How is that, Lord? It will have animal awareness and a new cunning. The spice will be more dangerous to seek and far more perilous to keep. Maneo had looked up at the cavern's rocky ceiling, his imagination probing through the rock to the surface. Everything desert again, Lord? Water courses will fill with sand, crops will be choked and killed, trees will be covered by great moving dunes, the sand death will spread until… until a subtle signal is heard in the barren lands. What signal, Lord? The signal for the next cycle, the coming of the Maker, the coming of Shai Hulud. Will that be you, Lord? Yes! The great sandworm of Dune will rise once more from the deeps. This land will be again the domain of spice and worm. But what of the people, Lord? All of the people? Many will die. Food plants and the abundant growth of this land will be parched. Without nourishment, meat animals will die. Will everyone go hungry, Lord? Under nourishment and the old diseases will stalk the land, while only the hardiest survive, the hardiest and most brutal. Leto II's transformation of Arrakis, his adjustment of the ecological plans of the old Atreides Empire and its regency, are undertaken in the long term to allow the conditions to be created that will permit the reintroduction of the new sandworm species. As the little makers were dying out under the previous ecological changes, sand trout cannot move into the sandworm stage of their life cycle without abundant sources of water which they insist and devour. Leto II's understanding of the life cycle of the sandworm is due to his symbiosis with the worms his other memory, and his prescience. It is this that allows him to function as a perfect ecologist, creating both the conditions for the transformation of Arrakis and foreseeing the consequences. To Frank Herbert, ecology was the science of the understanding of consequences, and Leto II, as a tyrant, controls the empire through the ecology of Arrakis as a hydraulic dictator. The Atreides' control of human institutions and systems through ecology is fundamental to his warnings of dangerous heroes using ecology as a platform for their own specific needs. The mistakes that Paul Atreides makes in beginning the Golden Path and then turning away from it are amplified throughout the millennium, ultimately destroying the Fremen. The use of hydraulic despotism also results in the destruction of Arrakis at the end of Chapter House Dune, artificial melange meaning the old empire has finally died away. The use and reliance of systems by human beings in governing their actions, in this specific case ecology as a tool for environmental, social, political and religious change, also marks Herbert's belief in both understanding systems and our reliance upon them. In the case of the ecological and political transformation of Arrakis, and subsequently the Empire, Herbert shows the need to break away from the stagnancy that such systems can cause by their feedback loops.
The nature of chaos in creating new dynamics within such systems is illustrated most interestingly by Palumbo's examination of the Dune series as a chaos theory model, showing that Arrakis's ecology is a dynamical system that might be radically altered through a minimal change in a key variable affecting its interlocking feedback loops. In its portrayal of ecology on a planetary scale, the Dune series represents the most immersive and complex examination of humanity's environmental concerns that science fiction had ever seen. Herbert plunges the reader into an incredibly detailed desert planet and its people, who have a complex and fully integrated means of survival upon it. In doing so, no facet of the complexities of ecology can be lost in such a story. Dune is indeed an ecological primer of sorts, and its examination of the complexities of environmental issues that are increasingly important in today's society show clearly why Dune and its sequels remain bestsellers over 50 years after their initial publication, and why Dune itself is seen as the pinnacle of science fiction literature.